Michelangelo Buonarroti is one of the most famous artists uh, in art history. Uh, he does have a family name, Buonarroti, but we usually don't use it. We usually just call him Michelangelo because that is what he was known as uh, in his own day. Now, he lived a long life from 1475 to 1564. And during that time, his style changed. So we're going to look at his style, his high Renaissance style. And then when he started exaggerating some of his characteristics, we will call that his mannerist style. Incidentally, that date of his death, or that year of his death, 1564, is the year that William Shakespeare was born. And for some people, that's uh, an easy way to remember uh, the, the date of Michelangelo's death. He was a Florentine, born under the Great Dome. And, of course, the Great Dome is Brunelleschi's Dome of the Cathedral of Florence. Uh, very proud of being a Florentine. Remember, there was no united country of Italy. That's 19th century, late 19th century. Um, at this time, you have the city-states, the principalities, uh, and people are loyal to their city or principality. He was a very famous sculptor, architect, painter, and poet. However, we won't be talking about his poetry. Michelangelo's favorite medium was marble. And he described himself as a carver of noble marbles. He even said that he took in marble dust with his nurse's milk. Um, his nurse, his wet nurse, uh, was the wife of a stone carver at Carrera, um, in the quarries at Carrera. Uh, this is where you get this very fine, uh, beautiful white marble uh, from it in Italy that Michelangelo used uh, to carve his figures. Uh, Italy has a lot of different kinds of marbles, the white marble from Carrera and colored marbles from other areas. Well, Michelangelo thought that the epitome of art, the most important thing in art, was to be able to show human anatomy. And his favorite subject is the muscular male nude. Like Leonardo, he dissected bodies in order to study anatomy. But the purpose of his interest was a bit different. It was to improve his art it was to show accurately the human body. He probably wasn't particularly interested in something like the circulation of the blood because that's probably not going to affect uh, his stone carving. Now, we're looking at one of his unfinished works. And this was a figure that was supposed to adorn uh, a very elaborate freestanding tomb of Pope Julius II, who was an important patron for Michelangelo. And Julius uh, had commissioned this huge tomb, uh, which was not completed. Um, after he died, um, just certain bits and pieces were put together uh, with a much reduced wall tomb in the church of San Pietro in Vincole. So there were all of these unfinished statues. Uh, one of the reasons Michelangelo didn't finish some of his statues was because he just took on these huge commissions and he didn't delegate. He didn't, um, for example, do a drawing or a bozzetti, which would be like a little model, a modella, in um, in clay, and then turn it over to uh, another sculptor to carve uh, so that he could concentrate on just a few pieces and you know other people could do this. He wanted to carve it all himself. Um, another reason, of course, would be he'd get pulled from one job to another uh, between very important patrons. Uh, you know, the Pope would, uh, for example, not be paying him to do the uh, uh, the Julius tomb, um, you know, when he was, when the Pope was running a war. And so, um, you know, Michelangelo would go work for the Medici, and then the Pope would call him back to Rome. And, 
there were times when the Pope said, do something else, such as paint the Sistine Chapel ceiling. So um, he has many unfinished uh, statues. And these are very interesting to us today because they show you how Michelangelo worked. He would start with a block of marble. Uh, generally, all his sculptures are carved out of a single block of marble. Um, he doesn't, you know, peg several blocks together or something like that. And most sculptors, after they've made their studies, their drawings, and their little clay models, um, they would start working on the block by roughing out, if it's a figure in the round, roughing out all the different sides. So you would be, uh, you know, carving from the back and carving from the front and just getting sort of a general thing and then going in further. But Michelangelo didn't work that way. He said that he could see the figure within the marble. And he just had to carve away the stone around it to release the figure. And he would start at the front and carve in. And as you can see, there are parts of the figure that are finished. They're even polished. Uh, and other parts that simply have not been carved. And it gives the appearance because, of course, he's using all of these figures in various forms of contrapposto. Um, in this case, in this very twisting posture. So it almost looks like the figure is trying to pull itself out of the block. This has been compared to Neoplatonic philosophy, to the idea of the soul encased in the rude matter of the flesh and the soul wanting to be free, um, analogous to the figure encased in the rude matter of the stone and trying to uh, free itself as it appears uh, when we're looking at this. And um, Michelangelo would have been exposed to Neoplatonism uh, in the Medici household. Uh, originally, he was apprenticed to a painter, Ghirlandaio, to learn to paint, but he decided his interest was in sculpture. And as a young man, he worked in the Medici household, um, the, the household under Lorenzo the Magnificent. Lorenzo di Piero de Medici. And remember that in Lorenzo the Magnificent's household, he also uh, was a patron to humanist scholars like Ficino and Pico della Mirandola and uh, the poet Poliziano. So Michelangelo certainly could have been exposed to Neoplatonic ideas. Now, people disagree about how much of that shows up in his art. Uh, some people are certain it's, you know, the very crux of his art, and other people think, no, not at all. <laughs> um, so I mention it. One of the most famous works by Michelangelo is this uh, Pietà, which was created when he was in his mid-twenties. Now, when we say Pietà, it's an Italian word that means both pity and piety. But when we refer to it in art, we're talking about a particular subject when, after the crucifixion, Mary, the mother of Jesus, is holding her dead son and mourning over his body. Now, this is a devotional image. It's something you're just supposed to look at and meditate on the suffering of Christ uh, and the suffering of Mary. And essentially, it is excerpted or taken out of a lamentation. And here I'm showing you a, a lamentation fresco that's about 200 years older than uh, Michelangelo's Pietà, uh, but it's by uh, the very famous Florentine artist Giotto and um, gives us a good example of a lamentation over the body of Christ. This is a narrative scene. It's in a whole series of pictures showing the life of Christ, and here we're in the passion scenes, uh, the scenes of Christ uh, suffering and dying. And as you can see, um, it has many more figures than the Pietà. You have Christ 
lying there across the lap of his mother and Mary embracing him and looking into his face. And you have Mary Magdalene seated at his feet and holding his feet. Uh, St. John is leaning over, um, standing on the right side of the picture. You've got uh, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. And then, of course, uh, the holy women uh, surround uh, uh, the body of Christ. Even the angels are weeping at the death of Christ. So this has a lot of figures. It's in a setting. You see a little mountain and a, a dead tree to remind us of the death of Christ. Um, it comes out of devotional literature. Uh, neither the Pieta nor the Lamentation are in the Bible. The Bible says that Christ's followers, they took him down from the cross and laid him in the tomb. They don't say anything about the followers mourning him or the body lying on his mother's lap. And there's a very good reason for that. In Judaism, you are not allowed to bury bodies on the Sabbath. And of course, the Sabbath begins Friday night at sunset. And it lasts Sunday night. Excuse me. It, it, the Sabbath begins Friday night at sunset. And it lasts until sunset on Saturday. So, the followers of Jesus had to get his body into the tomb quickly before sunset. But on Sunday morning, the holy women came to the tomb to anoint the body of Christ. In other words, they were going to do the um, they were going to do the preparation of the body, uh, the morning. No, after the Sabbath. But when they came, of course, they did not find the body. Uh, they found that Christ had been raised from the dead, as the Bible says, the resurrection. So where did this idea about the lamentation come from? Well, it seems to have originated in Byzantine devotional literature and then appears in Byzantine art. And from there, uh, it appears in Western art uh, and becomes a very important subject in Western art. Well, if you can just imagine uh, having this narrative scene and taking out the two main figures and making a separate work of art from that. Uh, and that would be, of course, be uh, Mary and Christ. And that's what the Pieta is. It, because it's out of its narrative context, it becomes devotional. Now, this was a subject that actually originated in Northern Europe. And the patron for this was a French cardinal. Uh, but you see this subject, um, well, all over Germany and in some places in the Netherlands. Uh, it is, as I said, a northern uh, topic. And then, of course, it gets very, very popular in Italy as well. Um, I'm showing you a early 14th century German Vesperbild. Uh, they don't usually call it a Pieta in, uh, in German. Uh, that's an Italian word. Uh, it's usually known as a Vesperbild. Uh, Vespers, of course, is the sunset service, and Bild means image. So it's sort of like uh, the image the, to look at at ve Vespers or to pray to at Vespers. And other subjects are also included under this title of Vesper Bild. But um, as you see, this is the same subject in this case. And when you look at this, the German work is showing you... Um, almost an expressionistic way of showing you the death of Christ and the sorrow of the Virgin. Uh, their heads are very large. Uh, Mary has an expression of pain on her face. Uh, Christ's body is very thin and angular and the, the head just you know, drops back. And there are these huge globules of blood that almost look like bunches of grapes. Uh, which then, of course, that emphasizes the Eucharistic connection. Uh, none of that exaggeration and suffering uh, can be found in Michelangelo's Pieta. It's a very different kind of Pieta. It's the High Renaissance Pieta in which idealism and restrained emotion are what is shown. 
High Renaissance artists, of course, were very interested in idealization, of perfecting the beauty of the figures. Um, and they were also very interested, of course, in mathematical proportions of the figures. Uh, what was, uh, what were the most beautiful, what are the most beautiful proportions? And when you look at the face of this virgin, you know, this just beautiful figure, it probably reminds you of the face of the Virgin of the Rocks by Leonardo da Vinci, because the proportions are pretty much the same. Now, there is a couple of stories that I want to tell you about this statue. Um, this is the only statue that Michelangelo ever signed. And the reason is because uh, after he finished it, uh, two people were looking at it and he overheard them. And one person was saying, well, who, who, you know, who's the sculptor? Who's the artist? And uh, the other person said, well, I don't know. I think it's so-and-so and named another artist. So Michelangelo went in the next night and carved his name on the band that goes diagonally across the Virgin's breast. So everyone would know that it was his work. Also, you probably know that everybody's a critic. And this painting, and this statue was criticized. There was someone who said to Michelangelo, well, this isn't right. You've shown the Virgin as a young woman. She couldn't possibly have a son who's 33 years old. And Michelangelo replied, well, don't you know that when a woman is absolutely pure, when she never sins, that she retains her youthful beauty. So you can see what he does. He has a, a kind of theological excuse, if you will, for creating this idealized, youthful, beautiful Virgin Mary. And he also sort of makes it sound like, well, if you don't believe that, you know, you're a heretic. <laughs> because, of course, there's only one woman who, according to Christian theology, uh, was uh, always pure and always sinless, and that was the Virgin Mary. You can also see the beauty of the male body uh, in the face of Christ and the body of Christ. And you'll notice that, you know, this this is a dead body. It's before rigor mortis has set in. The body is uh, relaxed, almost flaccid, uh, just sort of draped across Mary's lap. And the figure of Mary is enlarged. So, um, you know, so the Christ does fit across her lap. And we're going to talk about that. Um, one of the things that you'll be seeing with high Renaissance artists such as Leonardo and such as Michelangelo and Raphael is they will show you emotion. They will show you the movements of the mind. But sometimes it's very subtle. So here we've seen sorrow. We're seeing grief. But Mary's face isn't all contorted with weeping and crying out because he wants to show the beauty of the human figure. So it's a quiet kind of sorrow or a quiet, restrained kind of grief. And you can see that she displays the body of Christ for our veneration. One arm is out. Uh, the other arm uh, holds Christ with the winding cloth or the shroud uh, between her hand and Christ. And here you see a detail of the wound of Christ. Uh, instead of, you know, paint or globules of blood or, you know, three-dimensional droplets. It's very clean. It's very subtle. It's a cut. And her fingers pointing to it do draw your attention to it, but there's not gory detail. This is idealized. It's perfected. And it is restrained. Another thing that you'll notice is that um, like Leonardo, like Raphael, uh, like many Renaissance artists, Michelangelo is trying to unify two figures, or more than one figure, within a single geometric shape. And the preferred shape seems to be uh, a pyramid, 
if you're thinking three-dimensionally or if you're you know, thinking flat, uh, a triangle. Uh, something that has a wide base, so it's very stable, and an apex, in this case, the Virgin's head. And so you can see that Christ is draped over her, her knees uh, and the body doesn't you know, stick out on either side, which you do see in some um, northern um, statues of the Pieta. The other very famous statue uh, by Michelangelo is his statue of David. And this is created, as you can see, just after the Pieta. In fact, a good date to think about for these works of art by Michelangelo is circa 1500 or approximately 1500. Uh, the Pieta was created, what, 1499 to 1501. Uh, David immediately after 1501 to 1504, so very close to the year 1500. Now, this statue was originally planned to go high on the buttress of the Cathedral of Florence. And we think that that's why the head is large for the proportions of the body. Because if you were looking up from below and the head was the normal size if, as when you were looking straight on, then the head might look like it was too small. But looking up below, it would still be visible and would take on more normal proportions. However, however, when Michelangelo finished the statue, the Committee of the Works of the Cathedral, the Opera del Duomo, decided that this was just, you know, too beautiful to go way up high where people couldn't see it. And so it was decided to put it on a pedestal outside the Palazzo Vecchio, the old palace or the city hall. And there it stayed for centuries until uh, the Accademia uh, in Florence was built. And uh, the Accademia now has a rotunda uh, which houses this statue. And you're seeing that a little bit in the background. Uh, so it has one room just for this with a dome over it. And you can walk around and look at uh, Michelangelo's David. They have put copies of it all the way through Florence. It really has become a symbol of Florence. And there is a copy in its original location outside the Palazzo Vecchio. I should also point out that when this is photographed, they almost always photograph it from one point of view. So it seems like there's one main point of view. Yes, you can go around and take photographs or look at uh, the statue in the round. It's freestanding. But this seems to be, you know, like the main viewpoint. And we think that most Renaissance statues had one main point of view. And then the other viewpoints, as you look at them, were subsidiary. And this is very different than mannerism, which has multiple points of view. Another thing I should tell you about this is the block from which he carved it was a spoiled block. Uh, another artist, uh, Agostino di Duccio, had uh, started carving on it uh, in the 15th century. And they found a flaw in the marble. And so the block was abandoned. But, you know, blocks of marble are pretty expensive. So, um, you know, basically, it was given to Michelangelo and said, see what you can do with it. And he was able uh, to avoid the flaw and carve this statue. Now, one of the interesting things about doing digital images is you can uh, do comparison of the sizes. Uh, Michelangelo's statue of David is about 17 feet high. So pretty much three times life size. Donatello's statue is five foot two. It's life size. And of course, as you saw, they're both nude figures. Now, we're not sure of the exact date of Donatello's David. Uh, generally, it's dated somewhere between 1428 and 1440. Uh, some people now are pushing it into the 1440s. But when 
Donatello first created the David, he did it as a private commission for the Medici, and it was uh, originally placed in their courtyard of their palace. So it was a private commission. Probably at that time, you would not have put a nude, uh, heroic nude figure out you know, on the street somewhere. It probably would have been shocking. But in the intervening years, what, you know, 60 years, 70 years, people got used to nude statues. It became, you know, part of what was expected of art. And so, you know, the committee actually decides that this nude statue of David should be placed right out in front of the city hall where everybody can see it. But Donatello is the person who first gives that idea of heroic nudity to David. And then Michelangelo, with his interest in anatomy, uh, can continue it and also show another nude David. There are other statues of David, uh, which he's wearing clothing, Verrocchio's, for example. Uh, but here we see, of course, Michelangelo's nude figure uh, taking over that idea of heroic nudity. also stands in contraposto with the weight on one leg and the body turned and the other leg slightly flexed as though he could just make a step. Uh, it is idealized, uh, even if the head is a little larger, that has to do with probably the placement. Um, but he is a muscular young adult male. He's not an adolescent boy, such as Donatello's David. And as we said, this becomes the symbol of Florence. When we looked at Donatello's David, we saw David standing on the head of Goliath, holding the sword with which, uh, Goliath's sword with which, he, with which he had cut off the giant's head. What is the moment of the battle with Goliath? With Michelangelo's David? Is it before the battle? Is it during the battle? Or is it after the battle? Well, obviously, he's not in vigorous action throwing the rock, so it's not during the battle. He's not standing on the head of Goliath to show us, I, I conquered over him. It's before the battle with Goliath. And this is particularly significant because what he is doing is showing you the moment of the greatest mental tension or psychological tension, we might say today. Remember that idea of the movements of the mind, where you're trying to show what uh, the figure is thinking. You're making your viewer believe that he actually has thoughts in his mind. But this is the Renaissance, so the emotion is going to be restrained. He's not going to grit his teeth or destroy his face in some way because it must be idealized. But what he's doing is standing there with this very focused gaze, sizing up Goliath. And what he has over his shoulder is his sling with the rock in it. And you can almost imagine him looking at Goliath and thinking something like, I've got to make this one shot count. You know, if I miss... I'm dead, you know? Um, and it's, he's also, you know, it's for the glory of God, you know, that God will protect him. So it's the moment before the battle. I mean, we know the story, but if you're just looking at the statue, it's what's gonna happen next? So let's look at the face and see how Michelangelo does that. The brow is furrowed like he's intently gazing. And you'll see that Michelangelo has also carved out the iris and the pupil. Renaissance artists, Baroque artists, they always do that. Uh, some of you may know that in the fifth century BCE, uh, many of the statues, um, the marble statues have blank eyes, blank orbs. Uh, and the reason, of course, was that at that time they painted the statues and they would just paint the eyes in, paint the iris, paint the pupil. Um, but when classical statues were first dug up, 
or the ones that survived out of doors, um, the paint was lacking. The paint had flaked off, you know, centuries before. So during the Renaissance and later on in neoclassical period, everyone believed that the classical statues were white, white marble. And they thought this was the appropriate way to have a stone statue, a marble statue. And so, because you want that movements of the mind, you know, they are carving in the iris and carving in the pupil and giving you this idea of the focused gaze in this case, which is a beautiful example of the movements in the mind in a subtle way. Michelangelo was first trained as a painter. Um, he preferred carving, but he was also given commissions in paint. Whenever he painted on panel, and there aren't very many of them, um, but whenever he did that, it would be tempera on panel. He did not use oil paint, which uh, many other artists of the time did. You know, Leonardo, Raphael. Um, he stayed true to the traditional media uh, that had been used in Florence in the 15th century. Most of his paintings actually are frescoes. But we want to look at one of his tempera paintings. Uh, this is known as the Doni Madonna. Um, the Doni family commissioned the uh, painting. And as you can see, it's a round painting. Uh, we call this a tondo, T-O-N-D-O. Uh, and they have associations with uh, childbirth, actually. Uh, after a woman gave birth to a child, people would bring in gifts on a round platter. And sometimes these platters would actually be uh, paintings. Um, and so it's possible that this could have been used for that, but I don't know that it was. Uh, but round paintings, you know, this, this circle was a perfect shape. Um, so it's a kind of perfect Renaissance shape. It has no corners. It doesn't have length and width that are different. Every part is equidistant from the center. And, you know, it never ends. It's, you know, it's continual around the edges. So this is a, uh, it's known as the Doni Madonna. The actual subject is the Holy Family. And you can see you have Jesus, the baby Jesus, uh, held by Saint Joseph. And the Madonna, Mary, is in the front leaning over to uh, take. And the Madonna is the front leaning back to take uh, the Christ child in her arms. And you'll notice how muscular she is. She's got these very large uh, biceps. It looks like Mary's been working out. It's very, very interesting because Michelangelo, of course, is interested in the muscular figure. But also, as we'll soon see, they did not use female models. I mean, if you were having your portrait painted, you know, they would take your likeness. Uh, but for someone to actually model, especially to model in the nude, um, to show that much arm, for example, uh, that would be a male model. And most artists would then simply attach breasts and soften the musculature. Uh, Michelangelo sometimes, as you can see here, uh, leaves his female figures very muscular. Uh, Mary is in this contrapposto where she's uh, twisting around. It makes it more interesting. And of course, the edge of her, her elbow, her arm that's coming out to us is, you know, her arm is foreshortened. Uh, and you have that feeling of uh, going back into space. Behind them, there's a kind of trench, and in it is uh, the child John the Baptist. And then beyond him uh, is this row of nude figures. Now, who are these nude figures? We don't know. There's a lot of different theories about them. Um, some people, you know, it's just thinks, well, Michelangelo does not want to paint something like a landscape. He, he actually, um, there is a fictional dialogue um, that 
may reflect his ideas about Northern Renaissance art. And in it, uh, some words are put in his mouth. And he says that, you know, the artists from you know, the North, they from the Netherlands, just do not understand the true meaning of art, which is the muscular nude figure. Um, he says, they just try to do too many things well. They do things like landscapes and, and stuffs, fabrics, beautiful fabrics. Uh, so he was not much taken with um, uh, Netherlandish naturalistic detail. He didn't really approve of it. And you can see this, whenever he has to do a landscape, he does it as minimally as possible. Just sort of some here green paint and a suggestion of a, a bluish mountain. Uh, and to sort of block that off, uh, we have... Uh, these nude figures. Some people think that they represent angels because we, as we will see, uh, sometimes Michelangelo would paint angels without wings. Uh, other people think that they represent people waiting to be baptized and uh, that perhaps this trench is a baptismal font or something like that, or uh, the edge of the River Jordan. Um, John, however, of course, is the infant or child St. John. Uh, he's not the adult who went out and preached and baptized. Um, some people think that they may represent, you know, the souls of mankind. So we're not quite sure why the figures are there. We do know that it shows Michelangelo's interest in the nude, uh, and it very well may have an additional meaning. Michelangelo also was called to paint frescoes, painting on wet plaster in the Sistine Chapel in the Vatican Palace. Now, he painted two sections of the Sistine Chapel. Uh, he painted the ceiling from 1508 to 12, 1512. And then, some decades later, he's called back by another pope uh, to paint the last judgment on the altar wall. We call this the Sistine Chapel um, because it was under the order of Pope Sixtus IV in the 15th century that it was built. And this is the papal chapel. Uh, it's where the Pope would say Mass. Uh, it's also where the College of Cardinals meet uh, to elect a new Pope. When Pope Julius um, the second uh, called upon Michelangelo to start painting uh, the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. Um, there were already frescoes. Pope Sixtus had commissioned uh, many of the leading artists uh, of Italy, of his day, uh, to paint the life of Christ and some of Christ's Old Testament predecessors, such as Moses, on the walls of of the Sistine Chapel. So about uh, 1481, uh, you have people like Botticelli, Perugino, Ghirlandaio, Cosimo Rosselli, uh, Pintoriccio, uh, painting the walls of the chapel. And in fact, you can see here uh, on the left, a work of art that we've seen before. When we were talking about linear perspective, I used as one example, Per Eugenio's uh, Keys of the Kingdom of Heaven. And you can see that on the wall. The ceiling probably had something like, you know, blue with stars on it. Uh, of course, we can't do blue with fresco, so it would just be Oseco. Um, at any rate, Pope Julius wanted to have um, a more impressive ceiling to the Sistine Chapel. So he commissions Michelangelo to paint Old Testament scenes on the ceiling. Now, Michelangelo preferred carving marble. Uh, he probably would much rather have been carving Julius's tomb. But Julius said, stop that a while and paint the ceiling. And you don't say no to the Pope. But I always think it was kind of an object lesson to all of us. Because you know how often if someone makes you do something that you don't really want to do, you just do 
the minimum necessary to get back to whatever it was you wanted to do. But Michelangelo didn't do that. He could have had much simpler design, much less ambitious design for the ceiling. We have many of his drawings, and he starts out with a much simpler comp composition. But he decides he's going to show what a great artist he is. Michelangelo firmly believed he was the greatest artist who had ever lived. Uh, Leonardo thought the same thing about himself. And there was a kind of competition between the two. Um, there is one place where uh, Leonardo uh, says that painting is the superior medium uh, to sculpture. And he sort of mocks the sculptor. You know, it's, they, they have to work hard and they have to do, uh, you know, with hammers and chisel, a lot of manual labor, and they can be drenched in sweat. He says, and they're covered with marble dust, like a baker is covered with flour. But Michelangelo wanted to show that he was just as great as painter as he was a sculptor. And he obviously didn't agree uh, that painting was higher than sculpture. Um, so he was going to do work that people could marvel at and prove his genius, not even, not only in marble, but also in fresco. Um, and then, you know, with a later pope, uh, he is called back in the 1530s uh, to repaint the altar wall of the Sistine Chapel with the Last Judgment. Now, there already was a painting on that wall. It was a painting by Pere Eugenio, which was destroyed in the uh, creation of Michelangelo's Last Judgment, which we'll talk about later. But let's go back to the ceiling. Here's a closer view of the ceiling. And you can see that he has painted illusionistic architecture and sculpture on this. It's just a simple barrel vault. Now, there's no really moldings, no entablature or pilasters with the reliefs of figures. Um, and I, can you see right at the top, there's a kind of roundel that's an imitation uh, relief sculpture. And also here, further down at the body, between the, uh, the nude figures. So he's painted, essentially, you know, he's got paint and illusionistic architecture and illusionistic sculpture. So he's, uh, he's kind of combining the arts, as it were. Uh, but this is the way he organized his composition by dividing it into sections with illusionistic architecture, architecture that looks like it's real, but actually is just painted there. So his pilasters between some of the figures, and he has moldings that separate the different scenes. And here's a little diagram showing what the different subjects are. They're all from the Old Testament, uh, except the Sibyls. I'll explain that in a minute. Uh, and in the center, you have scenes running down the middle, uh, starting with the creation, the uh, separation of light from darkness and ending up with the drunkenness of Noah. So these are all Genesis. Uh, first it tells the creation story, the creation of the, uh, of the, what, the sun, the moon, the planets, uh, uh, the uh, separation of land and water, the creation of Adam, which we'll take a closer look at, the creation of Eve, uh, the temptation of man, this is the fall of man, original sin, and their expulsion from the Garden of Eden, and then uh, Noah sacrificing, you know, later time, mankind has grown up, but they're sinning, uh, Noah's the only uh, virtuous person left, uh, and then, of course, you have the great flood, and then the drunkenness of Noah, so, you know, even Noah isn't perfect. Um, in the corners, you have some more Old Testament scenes, 
Uh, you see down here near the altar, the death of Haman, Moses, and the brazen serpent. Uh, both of these are seen as prefigurations of the crucifixion. And then up on the other end, David battling Goliath and Judith having cut off the head of Holofernes. So symbolically, they are uh, some kind of virtue overcoming the evil. Along the sides of the ceiling, and they're not really all in this diagram, you see some of these uh, sort of pointed sections, uh, and then you have the lunettes below them on the, the, the sides of the vaulting where they're springing up into the vault. Um, there are old, there are the ancestors of Christ. Um, for the most part, they're just names in the Bible. Uh, in the Gospel of St. Matthew, it just you know, lists this genealogy of Christ. And um, you know, there's relatively few people that we have any knowledge of. Obviously, David, uh, Jesse is mentioned, but uh, you know, mostly they're just names. So Michelangelo felt free to uh, show the human figure in all different ways um, and you know, just put the names of the ancestors of Christ on them. And then running down the side of the vault, you see alternating the Hebrew prophets. You see Jonah, the Libyan Sibyl, Daniel, the Cumian Sibyl, Isaiah, you can keep going on around them. Um, so it's at each end you have a prophet, and then along the walls it alternates with Sibyls and prophets. So we've already talked about the idea of the Hebrew prophets were believed by Christians to prophesy the coming of Christ. And they also believed that the Sibyls, who were the wise women or the female prophets, the prophetesses of ancient Greece and Rome, were believed also to prophesy the coming of Christ. So for the Renaissance, this was pretty much the ancient world, the classical world and the Hebraic world of the Bible. You know, they didn't know about you know, all sorts of other cultures that we do today. So it was as though, you know, the whole world was uh, proclaiming that Christ would come. This particular symbol is the Libyan symbol. You can see Binet Loher, uh, you have the nameplate, it says Libica. And we do have the drawing uh, of a preparatory sketch or a preparatory drawing uh, for this sibyl. And as you can see, Michelangelo used a nude male model, uh, was very interested in uh, showing the muscles. And he also was very interested in showing uh, this complicated foreshortened pose. Uh, you can see the, the head tipped down and even something as what we might say is as minute as the big toe. He draws it over and over with just slight variations. Because he wants to get everything perfect. And you can see that hand holding the, the giant book of prophecies. Um, which is foreshortened in a way that would look just totally awkward if it wasn't done perfectly. So we have this very muscular female figure uh, lifting the heavy book of prophecies and you know twisting around in a way that, well, frankly, you know, could be injurious to your back, but makes it a very interesting pose. When Michelangelo finished the Last Judgment, you could argue that the Sistine Chapel tells the whole history of the world according to Christian doctrine. It starts out with the creation, creation of the universe, the world, and then the creation of man and women. And then they sin, and sin continues. So all that's in the ceiling. Um, and then you have the coming of Christ. But before then, you have the, the lives of the predecessors of Christ, uh, Moses, uh, some of the other you know, Old Testament stories, both on the ceiling and in the walls. And then on the walls, you have the coming of Christ. And then the final judgment, the last judgment on the altar wall. Now, one scene that's missing 
and seems so important and central to that is the crucifixion. We see prefigurations of the crucifixion, but not the crucifixion itself. And the only thing I can come up with is that because during the Mass, on the altar, the crucifixion was recreated in the Mass, and so that this sacrament of the bread and wine uh, stands in for the crucifixion of Christ. It reenacts his sacrifice, and it is efficacious, as they say. Uh, in other words, it's effective, or it works. It makes merits for the salvation of the souls of mankind. Now, here's a detail of Adam from the work that we're going to look at more closely in a few minutes. Um, but I put it up here to show Michelangelo's painting style. His style is often identified with the word disegno, which just means drawing in Italian. It means that he's a very linear artist. And in fact, as you look at this, you can see lines all around the figure. And when Michelangelo wanted to uh, take his cartoon, his full-size drawing, and uh, you know, put it up on the ceiling, what he did was he pressed with a stylus along the contours. And uh, the restorers say you can you know, actually see where he's pressed into the plaster. Uh, you can see the area. Uh, so that uh, you know, he's essentially doing a linear drawing. Now, the word disegno, as we said, means drawing, but it looks to us also a lot like design, if you just would change the vowels. And it also implies very carefully planned and balanced compositions, usually symmetrical compositions. Um, you don't just go, you know, making your fresco and say, oh, I'll figure out what I'm doing as I paint. Obviously, you can't change a fresco. You know, it's plaster. Um, so everything is completely planned out. And the style of disegno is often applied not just to Michelangelo, but to the Florentine artists in general. And also other artists who maybe they didn't come from Florence, but they adopt a Florentine type of style. Um, artists from all over Italy, but not Venice. Uh, so, people like Raphael, you know, he's born in Urbino, he works in Florence for about four years, and then he goes down to Rome, and his style also is defined by the word disegno. In the 16th century, they frequently distinguished between the disegno of the Florentine artist and the colore of the Venetian artist, which we will talk about later. They were famous for color, light, and even eventually loose brushwork, as we'll hear. So there was this contrast of Florentine, and it's not just Florence, it's you know in Rome and uh, over much of Italy, uh, the Florentine disegno and the Venetian colore. And of course, Michelangelo is a very good example of this linear style. Before they cleaned the Sistine Chapel ceiling, people had some wrong ideas about Michelangelo's color. They thought he used dull earth tones. And the reason was because so many of his paintings, especially the paintings in the Sistine Chapel, were just covered up with years of soot, essentially. Um, things like the Doni Madonna, the varnish. Um, you put a coat of varnish over the, the tempera paint to, to protect it and give it a little shine. Um, and, and varnish darkens with age. So until they cleaned those, which they've done now, um, people thought that Michelangelo used very dull colors. And they cleaned the Sistine Chapel and they went, whoa! <laughs> it was such a surprise. 
um, because they found these very bright color combinations and very surprising color combinations. Things that had been considered to be mannerist and, you know, very sort of unusual color combinations. And here they were in Michelangelo as, you know, early as 1508 to 12. And so here we're looking at one of the ancestors of, of uh, Christ. And, you know, these were completely covered with, with dirt. I mean, people hadn't seen those for centuries because they were uh, so filthy. Uh, and when they cleaned off all that grime, they found these bright, surprising colors. Uh, you can see the orange and the gold, but even more so, um, these kind of colors where you're using two different hues to show the shading. So you have the highlights on the uh, hose on the leg um, in this sort of pale blue-green, sort of a cerulean blue. And then the shadow is in this pinkish lavender. This is, you know, really unusual colors. And so people has had to change their idea about Michelangelo's color. One of the other things that you saw were the ignudi, and that just means the nudes. Um, because you have at the corner, as it were, of each of those narrative scenes running down the center, um, a painting of a nude figure seated on what appears to be a kind of marble seat uh, that's resting on the top of um, a pilaster. And these figures are in all different poses. Um, Michelangelo believed that you could show anything with the human body and that there were an infinite number of poses. You don't have to repeat yourself. You know, you can show your invention, your invincione, uh, your originality, uh, just with the human figure alone because, you know, the variety is infinite. And so we see Michelangelo's love of the muscular nudes, his study of anatomy. And then we say, well, what are these nudes supposed to be? Well, we know they're decorative, you know, they, they're, you know, they're at the corners, but we really don't know. And there are a number of ideas about what they might be. Uh, some people think that they represent angels. Because remember, we'll see, for example, in The Last Judgment, uh, that Michelangelo paints angels without wings. Other people think that they could represent the souls of mankind, you know, waiting for salvation. Um, we don't really know. I will point out the acorns and the oak leaves, uh, which frequently accompany these ignudi. Uh, and those are the emblems of the Pope's family. This was Pope Julius II. He was from the family Della Rovera. And they have uh, an insignia, which is the oak uh, and the acorn. We often think of the Pope as being, um, having spiritual authority uh, and being essentially a spiritual office. But the Renaissance popes thought of themselves as princes. Uh, they were not always uh, the most virtuous people. Um, and they also had a great love of their family. You know, their family was enhanced by having a pope in the family. Um, and so when you're in Rome, you might notice that in many different works of art, you'll find the insignia of the family here, the uh, Della Rovera oak uh, and acorns. Um, in the 17th century, uh, you have uh, Urban VIII as the Barberini Pope. And I, when you go to Rome, there are the Barberini bees all over the place. And you see these bees, which are the symbol of uh, the particular papal family. Um, I think the Chigi family has a kind of stylized mountain uh, that appears on um, Bernini's Three Rivers Fountain in the uh, 17th century. So, um, you know, it's not something that is only unique to the Renaissance or to uh, Pope Julius. Uh, popes are very proud of, uh, families are very proud of having popes uh, in their family. 
And here are two more of these Ignudi. And two more, uh, you see more acorns here. Uh, you may notice that the figure on the left, that there are some sort of white spots. This is before the cleaning. Um, they're not as dirty as the ancestors of Christ. You can see them, uh, but there are places where uh, the plaster has flaked off. And those are those white spots, which when they restored it, of course, they uh, sort of filled in the gaps. And the uh, image on the right is uh, another nude, ignudo, another nude figure uh, after uh, the restoration. There are still cracks, but uh, that one has been cleaned. And here we want to look at the uh, painting of the creation of Adam. Uh, this is probably you know, the most famous scene in the uh, Sistine Chapel ceiling. Uh, it's imprinted on t-shirts and you know, all sorts of uh, tourist paraphernalia. Uh, you can see right next to it, uh, the ignudi. Uh, and you can see that it's not shown as though you know, we're looking up from under, you know, we're looking straight on at it, as though it were just hanging on a wall. Let's look a little closer. You can see that the Garden of Eden is just some green and some blue. Uh, Michelangelo's not interested in showing you the background, the landscape. Uh, what he is interested in showing you is the anatomy of the muscular figures, these idealized muscular nude or nearly nude figures. And you have Adam reclining. You know, he's just coming into being, his body has been created. And then you have God the Father flying in uh, with all of these other figures around him. This isn't the usual image where you see God the Father just as a you know bearded man with a white beard or a gray beard. We see that. He's got a light gray beard. But usually when we'd see God the Father, we'd see him with um, a papal tiara, you know, three-part tiara, um, crowned with um, rich robes, like a king or at least, you know, amorphous biblical robes, as I sometimes call them. Um, in this case, he looks more like Zeus or Jupiter, uh, a very powerful, muscular deity. But it wouldn't be appropriate to show God the Father completely in the nude the way you would Jupiter. Um, so he's shown with this kind of translucent tunic that clings to the body and, you know, shows you how powerful the body of God is. And I think there is this uh, analogy made with the powerful, the power of God, the omnipotence of God, and the power of the body in this case. And you see that God is reaching out with his hand, uh, just about to touch Adam's hand. And people often say, well, this is where the spark of life is going to be transmitted, or the soul or the divine spark, you know, is going into the human being. Uh, who are those figures flying around uh, with uh, God? Well, the female figure under his arm has been identified both with Eve, and you can see she's looking at Adam, and she's also been called Mary, the new Eve, or uh, you know, the personification of holy wisdom, uh, who is there with, in the mind of God from you know, the beginning, uh, you know, even Though you know she comes into being at a particular time, uh, you know holy wisdom is always with God. God knows the future. You know everything that passes is in the mind of God. Now you'll notice that his arm goes around this figure and then touches the shoulder of this puto, this little fat baby. Um, and many people think that this is supposed to be Christ. This is supposed to be Jesus, uh, who was, as the creed says, co-eternal with the Father. Uh, the other figures are believed to be angels. You'll see that one of them seems to be flying around, almost you know, holding up God, although presumably he's perfectly capable of flying in on his own power. He's omnipotent. Uh, but you can see no angel wings. 
And uh, so there's an example of figures that are believed to be angels. Um, iconographically, they're in the right place, uh, are surrounding God, and yet they do not have wings to tell us that they are angels. And you know, here you're looking uh, at a detail of those hands and of uh, Adam. Um, there's no, like I say, trees or grass or plants or anything in the background. Um, and that way the hand is silhouetted against the sky or against the blank background. Um, and you can see it from the floor, you know, looking up to it. Um, Probably also, you know, Michelangelo just is not interested in showing landscape. Um, your text didn't show you the uh, uh, fall of man, but uh, let me assure you in Michelangelo's uh, original sin, the only tree is the forbidden fruit. Is the only tree of for, 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 is the tree of the forbidden fruit. There's nothing else to eat in the garden. <laughs> uh, it's a big rock and a dead tree and the forbidden fruit. So, um, you know, that's not one of his interests. And here you see it again, uh, be dirty <laughs> before being cleaned. Okay, now we're gonna talk about some Michelangelo sculpture and painting that's a little bit later. 